what is physics? Among other things, physics is perhaps the most fundamental of the sciences. It exists so we can strive to understand the motion of objects in space and time. And allows us to study how the universe is put together and predict how it might end up. How can we go about doing physics? How can we go about doing that? First things first. We need to set some ground rules. What does that mean? It means we need to decide a couple of things before we get started. We're going to set some standards. First thing we need to know about physics is that we are going to use something called idealized models. Those of us who took physics in high school may have felt endlessly frustrated by the seeming arbitrary nature of the things the teacher was talking about. Being a physics teacher, I can tell you that it is it has never been the physics teacher's job to purposefully confuse, but there are a lot of things that we skip over by accident because they are simply second nature. That's one of the things that we are going to try and um, cover ahead of time. Idealized models are one of those things there. It's something that is distinctly educational in tone, but really is the most useful tool. It is a tool that we use to describe, show, and draw physical systems. Now, what are they? Um, Typically, we use the word model to represent a smaller version of a real thing. For example, um, a model plane is, I think we all agree, smaller than a, a normal plane. Um, but in our case, in this series, a model is going to represent a simplified version, a simplified version of a physical system. Typically, unidealized models, real world models, have so much going on that it's impossible to account for everything real that's going on. And so we eschew a lot of those mm, non-essential bits and strive only to use the things the, um, the factors that really matter in the subject we're talking about. Uh, for example, for example, we show a baseball in flight. We are going to 
going to say that the baseball, while the baseball has itself a complex shape, it's not a perfect sphere. It's got these little ridges, these little bumps on it around the outside. We understand that the baseball has some amount of spin. As a baseball moves through the air, it spins as it flies. It flies in some direction. Maybe it's up, maybe it's a home run. We understand that there's some amount of gravity acting on the baseball. We understand that there's some amount of air resistance acting on the baseball. We understand that there's some amount of drag acting on the baseball. We understand that there are minuscule amounts of other atoms around the baseball. Obviously, we agree that these are not useful in our calculations of motion, for example. And so we decide instead to get rid of a lot of this stuff, and instead we're going to treat the baseball as a single point. The point represents the baseball's center of mass. This is an ideal version of the baseball. It doesn't, we don't care about the little bumps on the baseball. We don't care about its shape. We care about, we care about one thing, that it's an object that has some mass, and that's this point. Secondly, we're going to simplify these forces acting on the baseball. We're going to say that the baseball is moving this direction as it was previously. And we are going to assume gravity as we did previously. But we are going to get rid of air resistance. Because it's not relevant to what we're talking about, perhaps. We're also going to ignore the spin. The baseball's motion has nothing to do with spin. And if we're talking about the motion, we don't need to know about the spin. We don't care about the spin. We care about the idealized version of our baseball. We don't need to know that it looks like this, or that it has these shapes on it, or that it has these bumps on it, or that these molecules are in the atmosphere around it. We only care that it is an object that has mass, that has a direction of motion, and that is affected by gravity. And this would be the idealized version of this model, or the idealized model of this object. reason that we maintain gravity as one of our considerations is that if we um, get rid of too much, then our model becomes useless. If we get rid of gravity, then there's really no point in talking about the baseball. It's not really, uh, it's not an object. If it does, has no gravity, it has no mass. we get rid of gravity, we have no reason to think the baseball comes down at all. Gravity tells us the baseball will continue to go up until gravity acts on it and then continue down. It's a way for us to show the baseball's motion in a simplified way. That's it. our model will be useful in our calculations and of course the model only takes us so far but for our simple purposes we're going to need simple models
couple of things here that we need to talk about. Once again, we're going to add a couple of things to our toolbox. We're going to talk about several quantities. Time, of course, measured in seconds. We're going to talk about length or distance. Measured in meters. We're going to talk about mass. Measured in kilograms. And these are our main units of measurement. These are our main quantities that we're going to talk about initially. We're going to obviously add more to this list as time goes on. But for right now, we need to think about the world in terms of time, length, and mass. As we may be familiar with um, in science, we will stick with the metric system because the imperial system makes absolutely no sense, and so we will get rid of it and uh, not mention it again. I want to do one example problem, and this is going to be um, a very important point for us to observe during our discussions. Let's assume that a particular car has a top speed of 60 meters per second. This means that for every one second that passes, the car can move 60 meters. If I want you to imagine a meter as being about one stride. If we wanted to figure out how many kilometers per hour this value is, this velocity is. How do we go about finding that? Well, it requires a couple of things. One, how many meters in one kilometer? Two, how many seconds in one hour? And there are simple answers to these questions, obviously. One kilometer, we should know that the prefix kilo stands for 1,000. And so one kilometer is 1,000 meters. We also have um, some background in time, I, I assume we should. One hour is composed of 60 minutes. It's the same as 60 minutes. Every one of those 60 minutes has 60 seconds. And the reason I'm multiplying this here is because every one of those 60 minutes has 60 seconds. So I could theoretically 60 seconds plus 60 seconds plus 60 seconds plus 60 seconds plus 60 seconds etc 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 until I did that 60 times but multiplication does that for us so 60 times 60 we can use our calculator or we can use our mental math skills or we can use our long multiplication skills and we can say that 60 times 60 is 3600 seconds in one hour okay that's good for us to know so how are we going to do this we need to make some big decisions about how we're going to do this. The way that we're going to do this, the way that I'm going to do this, is the way that we're going to do this going forward. 60 meters, I'm just going to use M now, in one second. And this will all make sense why I'm doing what I'm doing. We need two conversion factors. The conversion factors are those things we just found. For example, 
This is our conversion factor for meters to kilometers. And this is our conversion factor for seconds to hours, or for hours to seconds. Okay. We see meters here. We've got meters here. In math, whenever we have something over itself, those two things cancel out. That's what we're looking for. That's the trick we're going to use to cancel all these letters out so we don't have anything um, left besides what we need. We're looking for kilometers per hour, remember. So I'm going to do this once, and then we're going to move on. 1,000 meters. We're looking for M because we have M up here. We have M up top. So we need, we're going to take M and put it on the bottom. Okay, we've got 1,000 M, 1,000 meters. And the only reason I know to put that down here is because it's meters, and this is meters up here. And I want them to be opposite, because I want them to cancel away from each other. To explain that a bit further, if I say 2 divided over 2, 2 over 2 is, we should know, 1. The same can be said of 3 over 3 and 10 over 10. They all equal 1. In fact, the same can be said as t over t and x over x and q over q. They all equal 1. So in the same case, m divided by m equals 1. And that's why I say that they cancel out, because it just equals 1. And 1 doesn't change my answer. Okay? Now, 1,000 meters is how many kilometers? What's my conversion factor that has 1,000 meters? Well, here it is. 1,000 meters is 1 kilometer, so 1,000 meters. 1 kilometer. I'm looking for my answer to be in kilometers per hour, which tells me that I need kilometers on top, which I have here. That's great. But right now my answer is written in terms of kilometers per second. So we need to cancel out seconds as well. What does that mean? It means that if I've got seconds on the bottom over here, somewhere in my answer, somewhere in my dimensional analysis up here, I need to have seconds on top. So I've got seconds over here, 3,600 seconds per hour. I'm going to put that up here. And the only reason I know to put that up here is because I have seconds, and I have seconds. And seconds divided by seconds, just like Q divided by Q, equals 1. So they cancel out. I'm going to cancel those out right here. 3,600 seconds is how many hours? It's 1 hour. I know that from over here, from my conversion factor. 1 hour. I could also write 1 H if I was so inclined, but that's okay. If we know this here, my answer now is in terms of kilometers per hour, which is what I want my answer to be in. I don't have seconds because seconds cancel seconds, and I don't have meters because m divided by m is 1. All the same thing, all the same, just different language, different words. Now we're ready to calculate. Our final answer is definitely going to be in terms of kilometers per hour, which is what we wanted. How are we going to find out what our answer is? The way we're going to do that, we're going to do use our ability to multiply fractions. 60 times 1 is 60, times 3,600 is what? I'll have my calculator here handy and ready to go. We are going to need our calculators. 3,600 times 60 times 1 is 216,000. So I'm going to put that right here. 216,000. And now let's do the bottom. 1 times 1,000 times 1 is, of course, 1,000. And we're going to use our calculators again. This is not a beautiful number. We want to have a final answer. Our final answer is going to come from taking 216,000 divided by 1,000. And so we get an answer that looks like 216 kilometers per hour. So this tells us that every hour that we drive in our car, we are going to travel 216 kilometers, which is extraordinarily fast. And I just picked this number out of thin air. I don't, I'm not sure our car makes sense. But in any case, our final answer is 216 kilometers per hour. We will see this 
structure. We will see this idea over and over and over again. And perhaps it will make more sense when we have a real world situation. If that didn't make sense right off the bat, it's okay. We're going to see it again. We're going to see all these things again. Next video, we are going to take a look at significant figures as well as a little bit of scientific notation. So let's recap. We're going to use time and seconds, length in meters, mass in kilometers. We are going to make sure all our answers make sense. We are going to make sure that if the question asks for kilometers per hour, we change our answer into kilometers per hour following this method. We also decided that in physics we want to use idealized models because they're easier to look at and they're easier to decipher. <coughs> in the next video, we're going to talk about significant figures and scientific notation. Okay, so long. Hope you have a nice day.